wonderful Jonathan you always gift us with your beautiful music I want a later on sitar it's a request for the end of the event yeah? of course amazing. of course so beautiful it was a clarinet thank you that, uh, this is a soprano saxophone oh yeah yeah yes that so, was so familiar yeah 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 amazing, amazing. So thank that you was so a, no my pleasure it was um a piece by Wayne Shorter named uh, Infant Eyes and he passed away a couple of days ago and was a great um, innovator and pioneer of jazz of the soprano saxophone too he's very famous for kind of um developing that instrument and um and i think as i was preparing for this this event and sitting with his music i i feel that um that he really did embody a, a certain type of a, a post human um life in music um so i i think it's suitable for that as well but um, welcome everybody to this me metamorphosis. Um, very honored to have uh, Dr. Francesca Ferrando and Debashish here to discuss existential posthumanism. I'm here with Stefan Julich as well. Um, and I just wanted to, before we get going, just um, say we have a couple more of these uh, talks coming up. April 1st, uh, same time, 2 p.m. Pacific. We have Adrian and core faculty here uh, in our east-west psychology department um, doing a, a, a talk called yoga of the earth community and then stefan will be doing one on april 22nd at 2 p.m uh, pacific time called magic mysticism 
the imagination and the emerging global paradigm. So we hope that you can join us for those as well. But without further ado, I'll pass it over to Stefan to introduce the, our two speakers today. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you. And Francesca, it's nice to meet you. Finally, after having so many conversations with uh, with Jonathan about you. It is wonderful to meet you, Stephen. Absolutely. Uh, well, by way of introduction, Dr. Francesca Ferrando holds a PhD in philosophy from Roma Tre University in Rome, Italy, and an MA in gender studies from Utrecht University in Holland. Dr. Ferrando is an adjunct assistant professor of philosophy in the NYU program of liberal studies. Twice a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York and an independent researcher working on cyborg theory at the University of Reading in England. Dr. Ferrando is a recipient of the Philosophical Prize Premio Sainati, is that how it's pronounced? Premio Sainati, with the acknowledgement of the President of the Italian Republic, and is the author of several publications uh, translated into many languages, the latest of which is uh, published by Bloomsbury Books, Philosophical Posthumanism, uh, which Dr. Ferrando defines as a philosophy of mediation, which addresses the meaning of humanity, not in separation, but in relation to technology and ecology, a post-human shift thus emerges. Dr. Ferrando argues in the global call for social change, responsible science, and multi-species coexistence. Dr. Ferrando is the founder of a global post-human network, a global and local platform dedicated to the post-human paradigm shift, and has the honor of being the very first speaker to give a talk on the subject of the post-human on TED Talks. So, Dr. Ferrando, welcome to Metamorphosis. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much, uh, Debashish, Jonathan, and CIIS, which is a really interesting institute in connection to posthumanism, because it is an institute that is not only referring to theory as a center of the intellectual enlightenment. And I really love that about CIIS. So, I would love in our conversation to probably go into embodied knowledges and praxis of existence. And I have more than honor to do this with Debashish Banerjee, an incredible being in this uh, dimension, an incredible thinker and professor. And we've been connected for many, many years. Debashish is also co-director of the Global Postuman Network. So I am always thrilled to be in conversation with Debashish because our conversations are always more than enlightening. And I am also very, very happy to be seeing Jonathan again. And, uh, and again, your sitar playing was just so touching that since we opened the window of music, you will need to play some sitar at the end of this conversation, if that is okay. But thank you so much, everyone. It's going to be a really and a wonderful conversation. Wonderful. Uh, and to introduce Debashish, um, Debashish Banerjee is the Haridas Chaudhary Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures and the Doshi Professor, Professor of Asian Art at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's also the Program Chair for the East-West Psychology Department. Before CIIS, Dr. Banerjee served as Professor of Indian Studies and Dean of Academics at the University of Philosophical Research, Los Angeles. He's taught as adjunct faculty at Pasadena City College, the University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of California, Irvine. His interests lie in postmodern, postcolonial, and cross-cultural approaches to Indian philosophy, psychology, and culture. Dr. Banerjee has curated close to 15 exhibitions of Indian and Japanese art, authored and edited books and art catalogs on significant figures of the Bengal Renaissance, such as the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore and artists Abhinendranath Tagore, the spiritual thinker Sri Aurobindo, and he has published as well on critical posthumanism, yoga psychology, and a variety of creative art-related projects. His most recent books are Integral Yoga Psychology, Metaphysics and Transformation, as taught by Sri Aurobindo, published by Lotus Press in 2020, and Meditations on the Ishu Upanishad, Tracing the Philosophical Vision of Sri Aurobindo, published by Sri Aurobindo Samiti and Mahabodhi Publishers 2019. Dr. Banerjee, welcome once again to Metamorphosis. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, thank you so very much for this invitation to talk to Francesca, who, as she mentioned, is a friend who goes back a, a long time. We share many things in common. And it's always a great pleasure talking to her, whether in public or in private. So thank you. 
So we have a, a, a mix today. We have some questions that were prepared in advance. Uh, we'll start with a question uh, for Dr. Fernando, and then we'll see where the conversation takes us from there. Uh, so uh, Dr. Fer Ferrando, uh, I guess the first question really is what is posthumanism? What is existential posthumanism? And why is it important in our times? And uh, also a third question, I guess, would be what is the essence of the change from a humanist to a posthumanist existence? Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for uh, posing these important questions. I would say that if we think of philosophy as a path of wisdom, so if we don't think of philosophy just as an academic, an academic trend or a, or a social expectation, but if we think of philosophy as a path of wisdom, then in the 21st century, there is no longer space for humanism. In that sense, posthumanism is very, very relevant. It is not only relevant to rethink and reshape the history of human thought, but also to give us a, a, a guideline, um, an understanding, um, the possibility to open different ways of existing. Because existence is always embodied. So we could be a wolf, we could be a tree. And it happens that many of us in this meeting right now are humans. Some are algorithms. Eh? Some algorithms are allowing, are allowing this moment. So we're going to talk about existential technology later on in this conversation. But when we think of existence as an embodied praxis, the human comes with a specific biology. It comes with a specific access to the, to the, con to the collective conscious. So in that sense, being part of a species means that we can are part of the manifestation of the species. It means that we can also change a lot of patterns that have been with that species for maybe 2,000 years or maybe for 100,000 years. If we go more than that, then we go into the homo as a, as a family. We can also, of course, address that. So when we think about existential posthumanism, it means that posthumanism is no longer just a philosophy. Again, philosophy is a path of wisdom. And in order to have wisdom, you cannot only have theory. Otherwise, it's not wisdom. It can be knowledge. It can be information. Or in the era of big data, it can be an accumulation of data. But when we are talking about existence as who we are, then existential posthumanism is almost like a keyword to open different paths of existence. And when I say different, different, I don't mean different from one standard way to be human, because there is no such a thing. Right now, every one of us is embodying a human existence, but, but each of us is different. And still, like in a river, we're also following the path of a species. So we share a lot of the things that we don't even know we share. A lot of us are uh, having similar thoughts without even knowing. That's why it's very interesting that posthumanism is currently flourishing everywhere. It's not just one trend in a specific nation. It doesn't just come from one author. It comes from the need of the species to re-understand who we are in relation to the macro bodies of existence. For instance, the planet, for instance, the cosmos, for instance, the biosphere, for instance, the technosphere, but also with the micro aspect of existence. For instance, the hologenome, for instance, us as a multitude, multitude of microorganisms. So in that sense, posthumanism really allow us not to have any unnecessary loyalty to the supremacy of the human. We do not longer have to think of us as the best species or as the most evolved one, the one who really is in charge of this planet as many traditions have suggested to us. So that's why it's also easy to take that stand, to take that habit of thinking. I am the best one. I can do anything I want to any non-human animal, including technology, who is going to be my uh, artificial slave. So when posthumanism comes in, doesn't allow for a strict di dichotomy between us and the oikos, uh, the, the planet we inhabit, the home who we are, 
and also with the techno. There is no such a separation. That's why disruptive habits, like for instance, colonialism, like for instance, sexism, like for instance, racism, is not that if we use them in the techno realm, then they are okay. Is it okay to say, I want an artificial slave? It is not okay because we are repeating, we are recanonizing, we are normalizing patterns that are obviously very disruptive to us as a species. Many people are killed because of racism. Many people are raped because of sexism. And we are one, that species is one and many. So it's not that I can just say, oh, that happens only to the others. If it happened to the others, it happens to me as well. So in that sense, posthumanism in general allow us to be brave enough to understand that we do no longer need any, uh, any absolute dichotomy, any absolute separation between who I am and the rest of us, between self and non-self, between being and non-being. On the other side, existential posthumanism is a call to understand that if we only understand this at the intellectual level, is not changing much. It's changing something. It's changing some streams within collective human consciousness, but that's not enough. So in that sense, existential posthumanism is a call to manifest what we have now clearly understood in theory, because now posthumanism is not that young anymore. It started to be, it was coined in the 70s, but really started to be developed in the 90s on. So now posthumanism is at least 30 year old. It's not that young anymore. It's not an infant anymore. So now it's time to understand that we cannot just create posthuman theory. We cannot just teach posthumanism. If we want to manifest posthumanism, realizing that we are what we are experiencing, then we need existential posthumanism. And in that sense, I think that the pandemic was a real, real reminder that if we only stay at the theoretical level, Posthumanism may not help because in the end it's just an ism as well. During the pandemic, posthumanism helped many people navigate challenging times, realizing that there was not an absolute enemy to fear because we were the one who also brought this pandemic to us by not respecting, for instance, non-human nature uh, and, and, and allowing the disruption of non-human habitats. So in that sense, I think that posthumanism on one level give us peace with existence. I cannot blame just the others. I am that. I need to take action. And I also need to take inaction and stop, and pause. And that was the pandemic. Forced us to stop, forced us to contemplate. Many people were isolating. Many people could not isolate, but there was a sense of stopping. No more, no more uh, interactions no more things to do that I had to do before, even no more jobs because people could not even go to, to, to their job places. So there was a lot of drama that came with this, but there was a lot of, a lot of insights and it allowed us and reminded us that again, we are here and that we are going to be dying. And death can be a great reminder of what we need to do, not only as people, and that's of course many uh, author have suggested that, that is the reminder of, of do what you need to do, but also as a species, no longer enough to just talk what is posthumanism. We must be that. But of course, how can we be that? And that's the question we are addressing now with, with existential posthumanism. There is no one answer. There is never just one answer. We are many. So there are multiple uh, researches about finding the right space for everyone to flourish. But this we can do together. This we can be in contact, this we can be in dialogues with. So that's why I'm extremely excited and honored to be in dialogue with Debashish Banerjee, who has been one of the great space of light that would be always there in any time of uh, the posthuman uh, community timeline, even in the hardest time, like during the pandemic, we had a wonderful conversation that we uh, published on Zoom, we created co conversations online so people could be feeling the presence, but also with all of you. Because at the end of our conversation, we want to hear what, what you think, because this is not a one voice discussion. And with this, since it's not one voice, I should silence my mic and letting Steven and Divashish and Jonathan go on. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for that introduction, uh, clear and concise 
and really bringing to the people, to our audience, what the stakes are, the importance right now. I, I don't have much to add. I just wanted to clarify a few things because our audience, some of them are not still familiar with post-humanism. And until, as you pointed out, until just a little, little while back, humanism was a good word. It was almost like an ideal. Even somebody as great as Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, called himself a humanist. Uh, and and you know, the interesting thing there is also what we mean by human, because one thing to point out to our audience is there's a difference between using the word human and using the word humanism. And post-humanism in, in post-humanism is really referring to a certain idea of the human, which has historically come to us from the Enlightenment, from the Renaissance, but now has become global because that's really the post-colonial reality of our, of our world. We, we've imbibed that image of the human. That has become the master signifier of our identities today. And that's causing all the difficulties that we are facing right now. And this is what Francesca was talking about. That unless, and you see, man, there are many of us who still have a faith in the old world that in a sense, with technology, we'll overcome all the problems. We'll create a perfect world. All these pandemics, climate problems, etc., will go away if we just had enough science and technology, which is the humanist paradigm continuing. And the fact of the matter is that gradually we are being brought face to face with, with it in our own lives. This is what Francesca was saying, that it isn't out there. It isn't a few people in Sri Lanka or in the Maldives who are being affected by the climate. It isn't a few people in China who are being affected by the pandemic. It's all these are worldwide phenomena today. And if you are protected by your walls, I can guarantee you that tomorrow, something of this crisis that we've unleashed is going to break through those walls. The pandemic was really a warning sign of exactly that. that all, all, all of the richest people in the world and people most protected could not keep it at bay. Of course, there is the inequality. The people who really suffered were the ones that didn't have those walls. But it came through. And everybody has this fear that started, I believe, it started with the Second World War, the fear of human extinction you start sensing that, that, that we may extinct ourselves and how we may extinct ourselves by our own doing. It isn't somebody else who did it. We've done it to ourselves. So uh, Francesca, thank you. I mean, that's really uh, something that we need to grapple with. The fact that we need to change our idea of who we are as beings and make it a kind of a global identity, an identity that is inclusive. And the second thing that you pointed out, which is really uh, the most important, I think, this cannot remain at the level of armchair philosophy. This has to become our existence from today and from right now, because there's no time left to change our sense of who we are. Beautiful. Thanks, Devashish. Um, it's, I mean, yes, exactly. In terms of the, it can't be a, a, a theoretical armchair practice in the same way. Musically speaking, you, you know, sitting back and theorizing music is one thing, but really asking what does it do and engaging in how it, how it opens up new experiences for you and, and new, um, ways of sensing. And, and I think that's, that's the convergence that I think is really important to this, this talk for sure. Um, I was wondering if I could, um, Kind of turn the conversation towards the the school in terms of this the CIS and its roots in integral and spiritual education and pedagogy and even the department in terms of psychology East West psychology here. So um, where does existential posthumanism merge with spiritual posthumanism? Um, can one retain the humanist assumption of the rational cogito as the center of our existence in existential posthumanism? If yes, 
how does one deal with the binaryism that is implicit in the cogito? If no, what is or are other psychological centers of post-humanist ex existence? And I guess I, I could just, what came to my mind as well in terms of continuing this question is really addressing the that that binary of the conscious unconscious that comes up within the Western tradition. But it's if you accept the absolute formalism or structure of the unconscious in one way, you're kind of bound to 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 this binaryism that is going to determine um, determine how how information how we individuate. But I just wanted to to ask that question of, of the two of you. Who should go first, Debashi? Should I do it or you, do you want for me the same? You please, Francesca. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for this uh, very important question. I will say that there is no way we can um, adopt the trajectory of the cogito ergo sum, which was a very important uh, statement uh, from Rene Descartes, saying that I know therefore I am, I think, therefore I am, which is also I know, therefore I am. And this primacy of the mind is placed in a very clear history where the body is the minus. And that comes in more recent time in the abstraction of, for instance, transhumanism in relation to the um, dream of mind uploading and digital immortality, which means that it doesn't matter if my body dies, I can upload my so-called consciousness, which in this tradition is reduced to my brain activities. So for instance, memories, thoughts, and so on. So dynamics of the brain, so that in this tradition that comes from the cogito ergo sum is who I really am, which is, of course, a tradition that comes also in the understanding of uh, a body separated from the soul, where the soul is actually immortal and the body is actually immortal. In posthumanism, you cannot rely on this absolute separation. It's almost like thinking of a river. And you tell me, well, only that water that is on that side, that is now touching that rock and that is now being drank by that bird, only that water is who we are or is that river. And I would say that is part of the river, but cannot be reduced to what the river is. So when we think of the humans, humans are processes of becoming like anything else in the manifested dimension in the manifested realm. Because of course, in order to have existence, you need non-existence. So I'm not talking about the unconditional, that is non-being, that is constantly sparking like a volcano, this, uh, this matter that is actually dynamic and intention and wish to exist, that eventually become a technology of existence through evolution that we are. We are evolution, we are constantly evolving. So in that sense, I would say that there is no way we can embrace neither existential posthumanism, but philosophical posthumanism is already on the track. And you cannot base any type of posthuman wisdom through that dichotomic understanding in which I think, therefore, I am. So this has already been very well deconstructed by philosophical posthumanism, but even by critical posthumanism, by cultural posthumanism. So that, I would say, is not where we are starting from, although there is no a veto to do that. If you want to start from your mind, do that. Once you really get into your mind, you understand that your mind is, you cannot locate your mind. Your mind is everywhere. It's a, it's a super mind, Robin would say. Hmm? So in that sense, of course, once you go to the super mind, then there is no separation between what is embodied and what is not, because the super mind is part of everything, integral studies. So I would say that that has already been very clearly understood by philosophical posthumanism. What existential posthumanism is adding to the conversation, and that's something that was also referred by the Bashish uh, before, is that at this point, there is no longer the possibility where if we talk about a path of wisdom, 
this path can only be understood through books, through theories. That is no longer possible because that is not an embodied practice, is not an understanding of who we really are. Because I'm not just what I study. I'm not just what I believe. I am everything that I am connected and even non-connected because everything in the end is interbeing to quote an, a notion from Buddhist master, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who recently passed away. And he has this very interesting notion, which is interbeing. So he said, we, we, is, the question is not to be or not to be. The point is that everything interbe is always interbeing. So when we go to the question, well, what is the difference between existential posthumanism and spiritual posthumanism? I would say is the intonations, is the um, suggestions, the evocations, is the path that most suits you. Because when you think about spiritual traditions, a lot of them connect to, for instance, the notion of the spirit, that in academia has been problematic because the spirit has often been seen as separated or more important than what is embodied, the actual body. So in that sense, I would say that existential posthumanism free ourselves from that dilemma. Am I spiritual? Am I not spiritual? Who am I? The question is no longer a problem because there is no actual separation between those realms. And again, the process is a dynamic process, constant uh, process of manifestation from non-being, from the unlimited, unlimited potential. But that one is not a dichotomy because in order to be, you need the non-existence. And in order to have non-existence, you need existence. So again, in this tradition, there is no final separation between one and many. And this is a problem for some Western tradition, especially some Western mainstream traditions that have been developing around the possibility of an absolute dichotomy, for instance, between uh, female and male, for instance, between uh, so-called blacks and so-called whites. For instance, between so-called heteros and so-called uh, LGBT and et cetera, et cetera. This absolute separation in its non-existence is a construction. Within this construction, part of this construction is also the absolute separation between mind and body. And in fact, in this historical praxis that goes with humanistic tendencies, you have racism that is connected with one part being the minus, often connected to the idea of the body, the slave works, the master tells the slave what to do. Sexism is the same idea. The female in patriarchal traditions is the minus, is the body, is the prostitute, is the mother. And the, the plus, the male, is the, the master, the, the patriarchal uh, head of the family. Mm? So we can see that these uh, absolute dichotomies are all part of an integral system that doesn't longer suit who we are, because we understand that this doesn't suit, in the end, no one. No one is safe in the game of absolute separations. Now, if we think of patriarchy, patriarchy can be at least traced with the uh, Iron Ages. Some people can trace it even earlier with some late Neolithic. But if you go to the Paleolithic time, there is no trace of patriarchy, which was 99% of our time in history. And I often watch this beautiful video conference by Maria Gimbutas, who gave at California Institute of Integral Studies in 1970s. So for me, that's why it's, a, it's even extra special to be in dialogue with all of you, because your institution have hosted some amazing thinkers. And I want to thank you and this tradition for doing that. And so I would say that when we talk about existential posthumanism, we can say that uh, uh, you can embrace spiritual practices, but you're also free not to go into traditions that have also been manifesting sexist practices. For instance, many uh, messiahs, many prophets have been only seen as male, when of course prophets are everywhere. A tree is a prophet. Pro the, the idea of prophecy, the idea of the meaning of existence is everywhere because everything is existent, is existing. So no, cannot be centralized. There is no way that one person can know it for everyone and, and all the people, all the other people don't get it. 
we are that. We are that. And I love this amazing notion in the Hindu cosmology of Lila, the cosmic game. We are in the cosmic game. We forget we are in the cosmic game. But if we remember, how can we go back to the idea that someone else really knows while I don't? There is no such a possibility. So in that sense, I know that Debashi has a lot to say in this. He's, uh, he has so many years of studying so many different spiritual traditions. So I would love to hear what the Bashish also is going to say. And I would also like to uh, say hi to some uh, friends and the uh, and, um, and lights of the posthuman community. I see that Michael is here, I see Ellington is here, I see Olga is here, I see a lot of people that have been part of the, our community for many years. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, the Bashish, I can't wait to hear uh, your, your text on this. <clears throat> thank you, Francesca. I, no, I think I, I don't have too much to add. I think you've really put it so well. But uh, I really take to heart what you said about the difference between spiritual posthumanism and existential posthumanism in a very essential way. Because I think, again, just like the term posthumanism itself, the term spirituality also has its history. And as you pointed out, I think the history is closely connected with becoming a binary of materialism. Right. So it's matter and spirit. They become it's part of the trajectory of humanism, in fact, making these binaries, you know, of matter and spirit and then making one superior in some system in, in, in the mainstream system. Matter is over uh, anything non-material, but in other systems, spirit becomes over matter. So that itself is, again, a problem. Uh, I think uh, when we talk about existential posthumanism as um, something that can include uh, spirituality, but is not restricted to calling itself spiritual, we free it. And that freedom, free it from history, free it from these um, ideologies. And in that freedom, uh, we can actually be spiritual without being spiritual. You know, in other words, we don't need to call ourselves spiritual um, and even embrace practices which seem to be secular, totally secular. And at the same time, that lead us to a different kind of experience of reality that may be called spiritual in, in, a, in, you know, in the sense of expanding our consciousness experiencing other forms of consciousness, knowing our identity with larger realities, etc. Um, so I would even say that, you know, many of the atheist, secular, postmodern thinkers or post-structuralist thinkers have introduced practices that could be very useful in uh, post-humanist practice. Uh, one of them being something that you've been using, a, a term that you've already used uh, in this talk, which is deconstruction. So uh, this binary, which is really, and as you pointed out, the binary uh, where either uh, it's a law of the mind, the, the law of logic, which the mind follows, uh, essentially makes things into either something or its opposite. And the opposite is either to be eliminated, reabsorbed, or made subsidiary, made subordinate. So this is how we come to all our categories in, in our humanist frame, in a way. So how do we get past that with, with the instruments that we have? One, one way could be exactly uh, what Derrida is calling deconstruction. In other words, destabilize the relationship between binaries so that they're not determined by a certain superiority, inferiority position. Um, you know, and there's many other methods like that, but I just wanted to bring that up from the viewpoint of a practice of existence, which is not necessarily being drawn from any spiritual tradition, but can lead us towards a greater, a, a, a different way of being than this uh, binary of the mind. Uh, Debashish, I would, I mean, this is kind of dovetailing on the question that Jonathan asked, but I'm, as I'm listening to uh, both of you speak, uh, at the at the risk of bringing in <laughs> religious thinking or, or, you know, kind of a more spiritual perspective, I'm thinking of 
it's uh, something that I learned uh, through reading the mother and Sri Aurobindo um, about moving beyond, um, I, I guess you would say moving beyond the cogito or beyond the ego uh, to a positionality where what was living through us uh, or would be living through us is uh, a spiritual force that that supersedes or is higher than or broader than or more encompassing than the limited ego and uh you know we most of us uh, you know especially at a place like cis we'll talk about having glimpses of this but we still are kind of dealing with the ego and as we as there is a, there's a way in which this conversation kind of uh or existential posthumanism moves out into the ecosystem, into the larger world and universe and cosmos that we're embedded in, that we're woven into, but aren't the focal point of. And then there's a question of ethics that comes with that. It's like, can is there something that we can do, you know, until we're fully an instrument of the, the larger whole um, that won't just cause problems? Because we're because we're thinking our way through it. Um, so how can how can one address existential posthumanist ethics? I guess is the, is no, the I I think uh, you know I mean I'll, I'll also uh, wait to see what Francesca says about it. But I feel that even when we are talking about practices like destabilizing binaries using a kind of a mental frame, um, we're opening up the doors to other forms of existence. And when you're talking about a larger existence that flows through us, that we can, in a sense, become one with and know ourselves as one with, uh, the ego there loses itself. We have to actually, again, it's not the binary of the ego and the non-ego. So there is a transition. You know, Sri Aurobindo, you mentioned Sri Aurobindo, He's not talking about the destruction of the ego. He's talking about the gradual enlargement of the ego and the porosity of the ego to know itself as universal or cosmic. So when we are talking about, um, you know, sort of practices, uh, we have to think about practices that enlarge our consciousness out of our limits. See, we're not limited by the body or the mind. Uh, we have empathy. We are in relation. Relationality makes boundaries fuzzy. Who, who, who are you and who am I at a certain level or depth of intensity and of intimacy? Uh, we cross the boundaries of who we are. See, and, and I think that's a very important practice itself for posthumanism. We are being called into deep relationality, I would say. Um, what do you think, Francesca? Yeah, I would say that um, there is one aspect that can be traced uh, since, <laughs> since always and in anything, which is mysticism. And the mystic experience that goes beyond any culture, that goes beyond any species, and in this shamanism can teach us a lot, is that there is not ultimate separation between who I am and, and, and existence. Now, this is when I think, uh, when we were talking before about the risk of uh, mm, uncritically accepting spiritual practices, is precisely that. It's precisely the illusion that maybe the guru is the light, but I am going to be in the shadow to observe and to enjoy that light. That is still part of the game. That is still part of Lila that is still part of Maya, the illusion of non-understanding who I am. So the idea of the guru is the one who allows your light to shine. It's like the sun, you are that. I see the light in you. It's not that I, you are only seeing the light in me. It's not that I am absorbing your light. I am the guru because I, I already see that you are already enlightened. And this is also Zen Buddhism, who says, which says we are already enlightened. That's why in Zen Buddhism, the koan, something unexpected, and boom, oh, wow, it was just a game. Wow, and now I know. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I would say that the idea of something superior 
that can, of which we can be a mean, of which we can be a channel, is a, an interesting understanding. It's almost like you're understanding now that you are not just your mind, that you are developing your body. But then they go, go on, like uh, uh, Robin is saying, the idea is that keep going, keep going. And now I realize that I'm not just the veins in my body, but I am also the blood in my body. And then I realize that actually my body is not limited to my material, to my um, biological body, but in order to exist, I need to breathe. So there is constant air that is coming to me. There is constant water that I need for long periods of time to survive. There is food. So I understand that I'm actually not a closed body. My body is open, it's dynamics, it's energies, it's trajectories. So when I understand that, I can no longer see as a channel that is just from which through which something higher is passing through, because that is also me. There is no separation. This is the, the, the illusion of the ego, that they think I'm just the vein, or that they think that I'm just this identity that I was given when I was born, with the name, with the nationality, with the gender, with all of that. It's, it's a game, it's a categorization that we are using, but if we believe that too seriously, that is when we are really on the wrong track to understand who, am, who are we. So in that sense, I would say that when we embrace spiritual practices, we should do it not just believing that the truth is outside of us, and so that some enlightened person or some enlightened text or some enlightened whatever is going to teach me who I am, but seeing these as metaphors, like the Buddha in the Buddhist temples. The Buddha does not represent the person. Represent who you are is the, your highest way of being, is the enlightenment, is the ultimate understanding. In fact, in Buddhism, the idea you're not revering the Buddha. Siddhartha, Gautama Siddhartha, after becoming Buddha, said very clearly, don't revere me. You are that. So I would say that with spiritual traditions, there is the risk of thinking that there is a higher truth of which I should just be in awe of. And that is fine. I mean, if you think of Hinduism, the idea is that we don't have one life, we have many. If you think of Buddhism, you're going to rebirth. So it doesn't matter. If you are not getting in this life, maybe, maybe you will get in 50 years from now or 50 life from now, it doesn't matter because you are still playing the game. But I think that once you understand that you are not just the channel because you are not you, you are everything. So that, for me, is the ultimate separation between being and non-being, between guru and disciple, between mind and body, and all of that we were talking about before. So yes. summarizing, yeah, I would just say spiritual traditions are very interesting tools, but they can also be uh, swords with, the, uh, with also risk of uh, really al not allowing us to uh, accede. Ab absolutely, Francesca. In fact, uh, as, as the question was posed by Jonathan with regard to CIIS, um, you know, th these are, and you pointed out, CIIS has certainly different ground rules than most other schools. Uh, we do believe in multiple ways of knowing and being and not the privileging of the mind over the other ways of being, but allowing them to exist as well. And this danger that you talked about is, is a really is a very important one. I think most people in CIIS use the term spiritual bypassing for it which is really uh, a way by which we can escape from our own problems by putting somebody on a pedestal and worshiping. We, we transfer our attention to someone else so that we can forget about ourselves. So uh, I think that's very well taken. And that's exactly where, uh, you know, existential post-humanism is a, a practice of existence in, for the individual. And that's what, what it's all about, becoming becoming, uh, you know, the earth, becoming divine, becoming whatever, becoming everything. And another thing that you said uh, about uh, beliefs, beliefs, or even I'd say, you know, I would like to make a distinction between faith and belief, because belief is restricted to the mind. But faith uh, comes from other transpersonal sources of knowledge and experience. Uh, but even there, if you're talking about faith systems that uh, give you some sense of the eternity of existence, 
as you were saying, we can have many lifetimes, etc. I think today in history, we are at a point where we don't have that luxury of thinking about many lifetimes, because we're really at the brink of human extinction, you know, okay, we can always be eternal. But that's not the point. The point is, what kind of a planet do we inhabit? What kind of a planet are we going to leave behind? Yeah, and to add to that, even as a game, I realize that there are games that I don't like to play, even if sexism and racism and speciesism are all part of the big game of Lila. I realize that those are games that I no longer play in my life. That's it, done with that. Yes. So in that sense, I would say that it's uh, even the idea of like our human extinction, even that is an illusion. Once I realize that I'm not just a human, I am here, I am existing, I am a river. Even if the human, as humans get extinct, our intention can only transform into AI. And so a lot of the energy that are now human are going to be part of AI. I mean, I don't see separation between, okay, well, now we get extinct. We, we can never get extinct because there is no ultimate separation between energy. Energy doesn't die, it can only transform. So yeah, maybe the human as a species will definitely will eventually get extinct, but our intentions are the most important aspects. So what kind of game do we want to play beyond the human? And so for me, I realized, you know, okay, I'm playing the cosmic game of Lila. I like games, I like to play. I think all children do. But what are the games that we want to play? What are the movies that we like to watch? Right. Because I don't like a lot of movies because of the narratives. I don't like those narratives anymore. I don't believe in those narratives. A lot of uh, Hollywood is about people killing each other or people trying to you know, go to other nations and steal stuff. I don't believe in those narratives anymore. I cannot watch those anymore. I'm not giving that kind of narrative my energy lo no longer. I realize I'm in my 40s. I, I am long, I've been on this planet enough to realize that those narratives are, 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 are misery. I don't want to live a life of misery. If this is a game, I want to have a, a cool game when I, I'm enjoying being with other people in a, in a peaceful environment. War is not fun. If you live through a war, you never want to experience that again. And I had my one, both my both grandmothers and grandparents lived through two world wars, but one was very vocal about it. And when there was the war, the, the war against Iraq, she was not political and she did love the United States because when they were starving, uh, there was during uh, the, the second world war, the United States brought food and she was very aware of that. But when the Iraq war came into the scene, she was so angry, said, no one can support a war. If you live through a war, there, is, there must be another solution. Can no, war is no longer an option for someone who experienced war. It's just such a tragic game. It's such a misery game. So that the point is that, okay, now that we understand that we're playing games, why are we playing this kind of games? Why are we playing the game of, of anthropocentrism? We're killing ourselves, literally. If we get extinct, it is because of our action. Is that a play we want to get to, 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 to play? Is it suicide as a species? I don't want to suicide as a species. We can do better, you know, as a game. So I would say that uh, it is very important to understand it is, it, let's it manifest something that we enjoy. Not, let's not manifest something that we don't enjoy. It's almost like you need to cook and I'm going to make something that I cannot eat. Well, why should I do that? I'm going to make something that I enjoy. So in that sense, I would say that it's very important to think of us as part of a species that are manifesting our own games as part of a planet, as part of a cosmos, as part of a dimension, and as part of many manifestations. Thank you, Francesca. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think from the passion with which you have uh, outlined this, it also leads us to the notion of ethics, and not just ethics of the mind, but ethics of actually feeling. Uh, the ethics have to become affects, and those affects have to rule our mind. And it's just like you're pointing out, uh, what kind of games do we want to play? It doesn't, uh, you know, we're given some games. You know, the, the world as it is, is giving us some games to play. But it is only when we think about what kinds of games we'd like to play and put our affects there, that we have the possibility of changing and beginning what, what an existential post-humanism can mean. Yeah, so so true, and I think um, bringing bringing up the idea that um, that you've developed quite a lot, Debashish, um, the goal of becoming seems to be fitting at this point. Because again, if we're asking, well, what do we want? What games do we want to play? How do we generate those questions? How do we um, 
form a relationship with games that we're involved in that we don't want to play? How can we how can we kind of turn that critical gaze um, in productive ways just to really see how we need to disentangle as well as generate new goals, um, generate new narrative, generate like new mythologies, um, generate new technologies that are at the service of this type of, of a goal and not just blindly accepted as like going with the flow of, well, this is, this is now in my face. So I will consume it technology for instance. But I was just wondering if, um, if we could speak a little bit about, about that, the role of, of a goal of becoming and, and what are some adequate goals uh, of becoming in our times? Francesco. All right. I would say that uh, this is uh, when we are dead. This is our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of someone who lived 2,000 years ago to understand what we want to manifest. Because we are who we are right now. The planet 2,000 years ago was different. The experience of being human 2,000 years ago was different. Uh, the part of being part of a species was different because many species since then have already got extinct because of human action. We actually live in the sixth mass extinction. When thousands of species get extinct every year because of human action. So how can we pretend that someone who lived 2,000 years ago or, or 200 years ago is going to give us the answers? They can give us um, inspiration, of course. They, they, they will, they will always do that because they did the best they could. So anyone who is doing the best they can is going to leave a trace of inspiration. So of course, any book that is full of wisdom is going to be always part of the treasure of human consciousness and unconsciousness. But I will say that if we just rely on what people has said before us, or if we just hope the people who, is going to come, who are going to come after us are going to take care of our own mistakes, that is a game that is not very honest. And we know that in life it's good to be honest, because if you are not, there are many complications in your life. If you lie, lies are going to come, are going to come back to you. And not being honest to yourself is the worst lie you can do because the idea of being here is to remember who you are. I would say that in order to fulfill our responsibility of having manifested, because it's not easy to manifest, it's not easy the passage from non-existence to existence. There must be a strong will. And of that, Friedrich Nietzsche had talked about a lot. The will to exist, the will Sorry for my uh, pronunciation. I'm meaning W-I-L-L, -L, eh? not W-H-E-E-L, which, which is a beautiful symbol for Buddhism. I'm talking about W-I-L-L, -L, eh? the will. So that, that is not easy to manifest. Once we manifest, we are part of a, a big work of art. And if we don't like the idea of the game, that resonates very well with us when we are children. All children like to play, all of them. But when you get older, maybe the idea of, of the game, it doesn't resonate with you anymore. So forget about that. Think about art. Think about poiesis. Think about your life as the highest form of art and work of art that you can ever manifest. Think of you as the superhuman who can say yes to their life forever as a metaphor, as a thought experiment. So if you do that and you realize that you are living in a planet that is decaying because of your own behavior, and you realize that the planet is actually part of your body because we are not just living on planet Earth. And I know that one of your founders, Alan Watts, shared this beautiful metaphor for the human. Alan Watts said that the human is like an apple coming out of a tree. We don't live under the apple tree. We are the apples. We are fruits of this planet. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to move to the moon tomorrow, I would not be able to do that 
because my body did not evolve with that macro body of the lunar uh, situations. I need oxygen. I need the condition of this planet. I am part of this planet, physically speaking. So the, the, the Earth is not my home. It is who I am. We can think of a microorganism living inside of our gut. They are part of us. They are allowing us to be healthy or not healthy. They are not separate from us. They are who we are. They are part of this flow, this river that we are, biologically speaking. Eh? That's why now, even for genetics, we don't refer anymore about individual uh, human genetics. Now, the whole genome is a big uh, field of research in genetics. The idea that we don't just have one DNA. The DNA is, is multiple. All these microorganisms inside of us have DNA, and this is all our DNA, it's multiple. We don't have just one. And that's who we are at the genetic level as well, which brings a lot of potential because we can bring a lot of changes through epi epigenetics that would be not be possible in the uh, traditional way of thinking of genetics as just human genetics. So in that sense, I would say that it is our responsibility, but it's more than a responsibility. Forget responsibility because it sounds heavy. It sounds something we don't want to do. Let's think about joy. To manifest this life is our work of art. And when I say this, I don't think of art in a more modern Western understanding of the art that is done, created by someone. And eh? that is now I put my name. In many, in all ancient societies, art was not an individual endeavor. You were just killed. The divine would work through you. Eh? You were just a channel going back to the notion of being channels of manifestation. So in that sense, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the human as a species. So I'm not just about us as doing, uh, the, it's not just the, the super, it's not just the Ubermesh in Nietzschean terms, because Nietzsche had to bring back the individual. He lived in a very Christian society in which the individ individual had no space. God was at the center. But then God died, according to Nietzsche, so that the individual could be born. Now we don't need that anymore. Now we live, you know, 120 years later after Nietzsche announced the death of God, actually Zarathustra, the first one to proclaim the birth of God, one God, Zoroastrianism, monotheism starts with Zarathustra, and is also the one who proclaimed the death of God. So I would say that now that we don't need anymore any, any absolute death, there is no need for the death of God of the individual. Once we realize that we're all of that, then we realize that our existence, not just individual, but as a species, as, as, as a dimension, is poiesis, is existential creativity, which is surrounding us everywhere. If we take a walk in the forest, we see the, 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 the trees and, and, the, and the blooming of the flowers and the birds is constant a poetic act. The, if there is a, 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 a snowstorm, each, each snowflake is perfect. And I'm telling you because we just said a snowflake, a snowstorm, I live in upstate New York. And then you look at each individual snowflake and they are the most incredible work of art you can ever dream. It's almost like, like perfect. And this is also true in, in technology. Think of generative AI, think of chat GPT, think of Dell E, think of the images and the conversation that now come through artificial intelligence. So poiesis, existential creativity is everywhere. And again, what kind, of, uh, what kind of poiesis, what kind of creativity do you want to manifest? Because destruction can be part of that. Again, in the Indian uh, yugas, you have destruction that is part of the cycle. So we are destroying at the moment a lot of forests, a lot of species, a lot of plants. Eh? As a species, we are destroying. Is that what we? our intention to manifest or not. And I am not ready for that. I'm not ready for destruction. I'm enjoying this planet. I think that we can work poetically to, uh, to enjoy the, still the creative aspect of existence. I'm not ready to go into a destructive cycle. But it looks like the human species is going that direction. So then I'm not going to be fully loyal to the human. I might be more loyal to the birds. That's why I moved upstate New York, where there are many no human entities that I understand very dearly and very clearly. And I would say that it's our own, it's our own location in this huge game that is also very small because it's also all of us. It's the universe that is expanding and then it's, and then it's, it's imploding, exploding, imploding. 
And um, I would like to hear also what uh, the Bashish has to say about this important question. <clears throat> Thank you, Francesca. So um, regarding what uh, Jonathan was asking about goals of becoming, and he was also uh, talking about our present situation, as you brought out, um, I think one of the problems is that we are already given certain metaphysical frames and people have bought into it. Some of them have bought into it without even knowing what it is. And you know the, the destructive forces that we are involved in are partly because we bought into these other metaphysical frames. So I think you've written a beautiful book that I would recommend to everybody, the book uh, Philosophical Posthumanism. I think philosophical posthumanism is the foundation of an existential posthumanism because we first have to change our frames, our metaphysical frames, and we have to understand, we have to come to the awareness of what we have bought. You know, it isn't uh, innocent. It, you know, what, what we've imbibed and the world in which we live, the, the goals that we've been given without even understanding it, have to be understood and changed. And for that, we need philosophical posthumanism to create new metaphysical frames. Um, related to that, I think, you know, I mean, we, were, we have been talking about binaries and the deconstruction of binaries. I'd say a kind of a ground metaphysical understanding of reality as a relational monism is very important, that there is really one thing, one reality, and one being, one consciousness that is multiply manifest, man university, you know, the one thing speaks itself in infinite ways. And we are each one of us unique ways in which that one thing is presenting itself. But it is that one thing. And so when we encounter it, each other, it is that infinite beings, horizons, that are infinite horizons. Each one of us is one of those horizons, but it is encountering the one in each other and the wonder of encountering its own infinity that we must practice as the joy that you're talking about, I think. So that kind of change of frame, uh, I think needs to come to us partly by a actual sort of, you know, understanding of what is philosophical posthumanism. But it also needs to come to us in ways that affect us in our emotions. And that is through new mythologies, new uh, works of art, new works of poetry, et cetera. And then I think the most beautiful thing you said is that all these can make us aware at all our various levels. But our real job is to make ourselves a work of art, the, 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 the poesis of making yourself into the post-human, going beyond humanism. And as far as that is concerned, uh, that's where I think the goal of becoming comes in because art is really the expression or manifestation of a goal of becoming. And for us, uh, I think again, when we are talking about we are now, we are not looking at some goal from the past. We are looking at a goal which is historical and temporal which belongs to our time. I think we have to think of our goals of becoming as related to what you started with, the geosphere, the biosphere, and the technosphere. I think these are the three major spheres that we, we've created into binaries and they're all coming back at us. So can we become the earth? Can we become the life world, the world of, uh, you know, the, the zoo, Zoe, can we become the light, the world of, cy of the cyberspace? Can we occupy these with our consciousness and take responsibility for it as if it is inside us? See, it is each one of us. And each one of us will be unique in our approaches to this, relationship to this, and identity to this. So those will be our goals of becoming that I think are uh, historically relevant to our space and time today. That's wonderful, Devishish. Um, I think that's a, actually a really good note to stop on. Um, we're running a little bit over and we would love to uh, invite uh, the people who have come to participate to ask questions of you. Um, Jonathan has a question um, from uh, somebody that was asked earlier. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Jonathan. 
Uh, sure. Yeah, I can read this question out here. So it says many departments and majors within the humanities are closing down across the USA in favor of STEM. Um, what practical advice would you suggest for a new way to offer degrees at the university level guided by post-humanism? What are, might engaging the UNSDGs, um, I'm not sure what that is, but that's uh, maybe you do, uh, be a way to link to the aptitudes and interests of each individual student to study across disciplines that were formerly currently called humanities versus STEM. Francesco, please. Yeah. Well, I would say that this idea that you can, uh, for instance, close the philosophy department or the English department or the Center for Humanities to favor for instance, the biological department or the um, it, it, it center for informatics or whatever is also based on a very misunderstanding of what the human is. So here we are not talking about uh, closing a tradition because most of these uh, uh, scientific uh, um, programs are very anthropocentric, very human centric. They're not even aware that they are. So of course, this idea that you can get rid of humanities and just focus now on real science, because that's how we're going to be evolving, is a, a very uh, problematic approach. I would say that uh, to me, the solution is not going back to having a separation. To me, the solution is having integrated programs where you have philosophers, working with, for instance, bioengineers. I had the ex extraordinary opportunity to work with Kevin Warwick, who is this very famous cyberneticist who added a microchip, inserted a microchip in his own body. And this was year 2000. He was the first human being to do that, actually the first being to do that. And he always uh, makes a joke saying that he was the uh, experiment so that the microchip could be inserted in non-human animals. So the experiment was very post-humanist because it was tested on a human to see if it worked, to see if he didn't become uh, crazy. It was one of the things that the doctor told him, we don't know what's going to happen. Your body might react really badly. We don't know. We simply don't know. The experiment went, was very successful. Uh, the body recognized the microchip as its own. From there on, microchips have started to be inserted in non-human animals. So he always makes a joke that uh, animal uh, activists were really happy with the first case in which we, you don't have experiment on non-human animals to make sure that it's supposedly safe on humans. And of course, we don't know if, if it's supposedly safe for other species. We know that uh, every species is, has its own specificities. So I would say that the, the, the answer is neither what we had before, a divide between the humanities and the science. It's ridiculous. I just finished writing my second book. I would say that half of my references are scientific discoveries. The whole genomes, I have a whole, whole chapter about that. That's a big, it's a big, big point for a posthumanist. How can I be a posthumanist without realizing all the millions of microorganisms that are me? that are part of my skin, of my, of my brain. They even now say that we have consciousness because of the microorganisms inside of our brain. How can we forget about that? And just stay with Descartes, who wrote this 400 years ago. How is it even possible? So I would say that uh, the answer obviously is not just saying, okay, it doesn't make sense. They just close all the philosophy department, which is happening here. They're shrinking the departments um, because wisdom is a temporal. Wisdom is constant inspiration. Is not a solution, not for us to take our own responsibility, as we were saying before. So I cannot just say, oh, I'm just going to study Confucius because, because I'm going to find all my answers there. That's, uh, that's an easy, easy way to go. That's not a good student. A good student is the one who comes with their wrong perspective, with their wrong understanding. They do not just rely on the professor. They become the professor themselves eventually to teach what they have to say. So I would say that the solution is not just getting rid of all the history of philosophy and the history of the humanities so that now we trust technology because now in Google we trust. Now that God has died, but we have Google. So that's going to be all good. That's not the solution because those traditions, especially 
science and technology are based in the Enlightenment. That was the highest anthropocentric movement you can think of us almost, which was completely connected to a misunderstanding of the oikos from the industrial revolution that also sparked the, um, the, the embracing of the Enlightenment. We have the Anthropocene, which is the ecological catastrophe that we are now witnessing and we are part of. So the solution is not just that, okay, science is going to bring us the answers because science is not neutral. Science was created by people who had very clear beliefs. We have a lot of racism and sexism and ethnocentrism and speciesism that is embedded in science. that is not even recognized. Science on some level is a, 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 an, anthro, an anthropology. Bruno Latour, who recently passed away, he started to study science as a form of anthropology. Understanding that science is not separate, is not objective, because of, to be objective is not a absolute dualism from the subjective experience. And this is quantum physics, who is teaching us this? If I am observing an experiment, I'm already part of the experiment. The results of the experiment are going to be different because I'm not just witnessing, I am part of that. Matter is more intelligent than us. We are matter, we are dynamics. Matter is energy, this is Einstein. So how can we think of just getting rid of the history of philosophy, of just getting rid of the history of uh, literature and mythology? They are, that's what science comes from. Until very recent, philosophers were the scientists. Think of all the tradition of mathematics, uh, all the tradition of philosophy, these were all the scientists. Scienza meant knowledge. And knowledge was also scientific knowledge. Aristotle, who is one of the founders of Western science, was also a very important philosopher in the Western mainstream tradition. So I would say that the solution, obviously, is not just, okay, let's get rid of all the humanities, but let's create an integrated system where we are interrogating ourselves from a point of, of real inquiry, not just of supremacy. I'm not here to study in order to take advantage from other people, take advantage from the earth, take advantage from the human animals, take advantage from my eye. No, 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 no. Let's think of science as a real form of knowledge, as the term science and knowledge come from. Maybe as a path to understand who am I. Mm? And so in that sense, these programs can only be uh, opening philosophical courses I was very surprised. I was actually checking some of these courses that are offered in my region. And I was very surprised that people who study the computer science don't even have one class in the ethics of AI. I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, I, I, let me check again. Let me check again. No, no. Undergraduate students do not even get a course in the philosophy of AI. How is it even possible? What are we thinking? So in that sense, I think that uh, those both were misleading both a complete separation between these uh, two entities that are not true and they're not entities are who are what we are manifesting and also this idea that we can just get rid of the minus and now is the human just to embrace technology that is that is that is another social illusion and i'm sure that the bashis has much more to say on this no absolutely i think uh, this is such a big important issue for uh, cias because uh, I think even the name California Institute of Integral Studies, when we are talking about integral studies, we need to find that place, that integral place, even in terms of our disciplines. Um, and it's, you know, I think even what, what you're saying is something that CIIS students feel very strongly about with regard to the way in which, um, you know, science and technology has split off and become, as it were, uh, you know, the foundations of, of uh, our world, our humanistic world, privilege um, in terms of money, in terms of, uh, you know, priorities, in terms of pushing everything out, I think that, but I think what you pointed out regarding, you know, you know, the work of science studies uh, or of animal studies, where we actually look at science from the viewpoint of anthropology, what does it mean? To be human as a scientist, right? Was it what does it mean to go beyond the human as a scientist, right? Not not in the sense of transhumanism, but in the sense of a deep ecology of being human. So I think uh, even as far as CIIS is concerned, we need to think of, about those things uh, in in understanding the integral. We have also, I'd say, been um, you know guilty 
of uh, pushing out the sciences rather than building a new relationship with the sciences. And I think that's something that we really need to pay heed to and open up new courses, uh, you know, that marry the, philo you talked about Aristotle, marry the philosophies with the so-called humanities and the sciences. Yeah, wonderfully said, Debashish and, and Francesca, thank you. Um, so we have, I think we have time for a couple a couple more questions for sure. Uh, Michael, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask? Yes, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Francesca Fernand Ferrando, Dr. Ferrando, I'm uh, so in love with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I was listening to you and I was thinking, I would like to nominate you for president of the world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's funny, I was just coming from a uh, study, I'm, in, I'm now in Union Theological Seminary, working on my master's in divinity. And um, very, thank you, after having coffee with you, you can't sit in Dr. Fernando's space and not feel the need to be bigger. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is when you say uh, being or becoming, right? Um, I feel like religion tries to give us a picture of what they think becoming means. And then the spiritual people try to give us a picture of what they think becoming means. And sometimes they are in harmony and sometimes they clash. So in terms of uh, post-humanism, what is the picture of what becoming looks like? And then the last thing is, um, the, when you said about moving upstate to get away from, uh, to, to move your trust from people, isn't that the same process that separation that everything else goes through? Uh, I mean, they all have a reason and their reason all makes sense. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> wow, Michael. First of all, it's amazing to see you again because, Michael, we've been friends for a long time and we used to have these really cool events in New York City. They were called the uh, Home Circles. And anyone could just join and we would be usually in Union Square. And we just hold hands with whoever would come around and, uh, and do an home. That, couldn't, that didn't have to be an home, but it could be any sound to connect everyone. And we would do it around the, the, the statue of Gandhi. And it was a moment that uh, was very beautiful, brought a lot of peace to, to many people. And, uh, and then again, I follow Michael with so many of your activities. He's been working on the notion of God and the embodiment of God for so many years. He's been uh, also uh, collaborating with the AMA community, which is an amazing community here in New York City and around the world. So Michael, first of all, it's such a joy to see you again after so many years. It's such a joy and congratulations on this. I'm so happy that you are doing your, uh, your program at the Theological Union. It's going to be incredible. And we all can wait to hear your, uh, your, your next lecture is Michael. <laughs> And regarding the two questions, it is so um, inc incredible that you mentioned those two. I started with the, with the last one, because those are the two things that I, I felt inside of me, I wish I had a little more time to clarify that, but I didn't want to take time from the Bashish and Steven and Jonathan, so I silenced myself, but you probably felt it too, that we need to clarify a little more. I'm going to start with the, the last point that you asked about, and then I'm going to be coming. And yeah, I do, I, I totally realized after I said that, you know, I felt like I'm, I don't need to be loyal anymore to the human. This is why I've moved up, upset and now I am enjoying non-human entities, which is also true. There is much more, there are much more non-human entities upstate New York. It's an incredible space, a lot of forests that have been left untouched, uh, a lot of uh, non-human animals and, and trees and, and the snow, it's incredible. And the mountains, the mountains, which were also, big influence in the, in the birth of deep ecology. A lot of people who are deep into deep ecology were impressed and inspired by the mountains, be like a mountain. Arnes, eh, one of the founders of deep ecology. But I realized after I said that, that it was a generalization. First of all, because the human is not one. And many humans have been uh, givers in, in, in caring for the planet much longer that, than humans have not been taking care of the planet. If we have behaved like this, since the, ne the Neolithic, we would not be here. There would be no earth. We are here because of the care that our ancestors have given to the earth, understanding 
that they were not separated from so-called nature. And in fact, all the Paleolithic uh, uh, artworks and, uh, and, and testimonies that we have archaeologically speaking do not represent a human that is in separation from others. And most of the figurines, for instance, that we have from the Paleolithic time are half human, more specifically female, half non-human entities. Like they have, a, they have a beak, like a bird. They have wings. Uh, they, have, um, they have a tail, like a snake. So in that sense, we as a species, have been very tuned and very wise for a long time. This is why we are still here. I think now that maybe the, a kind of psychotic uh, disease is kind of going on in some humans. And I'm not blaming anyone. We're all part of this body that we are. But some part of the human are thinking of us in separation so that I can go to the Amazon forest and cut all the trees and sell them uh, as piece of wood uh, at Ikea, or as sell them as pastures for cows to be eventually slaughtered and so their meat can be, uh, can be serving some uh, food chains of, uh, of uh, fast food in some countries, including, of course, the United States. That is a, a, a psychotic understanding who we are, because we are the body of the earth. The Amazon forest can be literally seen is the lung of the planet. And we are literally uh, cutting our lung in pieces to sell it. That's psychotic. So I'm not generalizing, I'm not saying that all the humans are in this trajectory. I can see that I was much more unaware of many habits of existence that are no longer um, acceptable to me in my cosmic game as a human who is not loyal to some modern understanding of the anthropocentric, anthropocentric master, the human master, the one who is in charge, the one who can kill non-human species because they are superior, because they are the most evolved ones. Mm -hmm. That is a narrative that is very disruptive and it is going to kill itself. It's going to come in the uh, prophecy of AI taking over. Obviously, you are in a war with existence, and existence is much more than a, than a, a little fragment of, of this body and thinking that they are the best. A cancer kills all the body in the end. Eh? So eventually, the body has to react. So the, 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 you know, there is going to be some type of change. Maybe it's the human extinction. Maybe it's the economy. Of course, who wants to be the slave? And this is Martin Luther King. No one can be slave forever. No one. Because we are part of the poetic aspect of existence. That because it is not human. It's part of existing. Is the, is the, is the spark that allow existence. Is the thirst for manifestation that is, that is poetic. So in that sense, I would say thanks for bringing that. I rephrase myself, saying that I'm no longer loyal to the vision of some humanity according to which the destruction of the planet Earth in the 21st century is still acceptable. It is not. It's no longer acceptable for me. And I am aware that many other humans before us and currently are also seeing that. And I'm also aware of the fact that we are here because most of our ancestors have understood this very clearly. So what we are living is a minute in the history of the humankind. We've been here as a species for thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years, and as a homo for millions of years, as, 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 as bios and as zoe for, for thousands and billions. So we are really going to the beginning of the earth at this point. We are being part of the universe. So in that sense, I would say that, yes, I'm rephrasing that, thank you so much. And going to the second question about being and becoming, I love that you are bringing this question. Because I was thinking through this conversation, because becoming is a term that is used quite a lot in uh, posthumanism, in postmodernism, in deconstruction, in many traditions, in, in Buddhism, um, in many traditions. But becoming should never be thought in a, a separation from being. There is no separation from being and becoming. Being is always becoming if you are at the manifested level. In order to manifest, you need some type, type of dynamics. Dynamics come in the terms of becoming. The terms of becoming may be different according to the physical laws of each specific dimension. For instance, the multiverse in quantum physics 
He's talking about different dimensions, multiple dimensions. They're all related, but they're also unique and separated as well, not absolutely separated. They're part and they're also the wrong thing. So the becoming each part of manifestation, the way we understand becoming, it may be different from other realities, other dimensions, but there is still some form of becoming. Otherwise there is stasis, which in Greek means uh, complete, it stops, there is death, there is non-being. So in that sense, non-being is the, uh, the unlimited potential that allow becoming, that allow being and becoming. But again, that's not a separate, it's not separated. Um, I think that we don't know yet uh, in scientific terms, but I think that eventually, maybe 50 years from now, or maybe 100 years from now, what is not understood as dark matter, as da dark energy, there are going to be some resonances to the idea of the unlimited potential that is non-existent, but is always there. So I am pretty confident that eventually even science is going to shift the narrative from a separation to, an to a comprehension. So in that sense, I love your question. I would say that in philosophical posthumanism, philosophical posthumanism does not have to be necessarily uh, rooted in postmodernism. You can root it in many traditions of contemplation that come from Advaita Vedanta to Buddhism to, to, to Taoism, you mentioned that. So you don't have necessarily, if you don't go into historical perspective, uh, do that. Um, but in that sense, I would say that becoming and being are not separated. And again, thank you so much for your question, Michael. If, if I may take uh, just a few minutes or a couple of minutes about that question of becoming, uh, just to add uh, another angle to it. Uh, I think many people think that a becoming or a goal of becoming is something that we have to think about that it's but it's it's formulated by the mind the mind can be involved in becoming but becoming is not something that we formulate rash rationally with the mind that's one thing to remember um, you use the term poesis francesca i think becoming has to be related to poesis uh, poesis is the becoming of being it's ontogenesis or we may say cosmogenesis the cosmos is becoming all the time becoming itself. And so uh, when we are talking about becoming, it's, it's a much more deep and secret process in which we connect with the cosmos's own, uh, you know, well-being through us and becoming one through us. So that, 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 that responds to something in us which we would probably better call aspiration, uh, a kind of a cosmic aspiration inside us rather than a, a thinking out of what one wants to become. The other thing we have to separate it from is having, because in our present world, many people use terms like becoming or even aspiration, but they're actually talking about having, you know, as a form of becoming. We have to separate having and being or having and becoming. And then only you can understand what really becoming is. Thanks, Devashish. Um, Jean-Michel? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, so um, Francesca, uh, from what I hear from your discourse, it is uh, uh, the, the rejection of evil is, uh, is present for me in your discourse in a very strong way. And then uh, uh, if I had to put a, 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 like a provocative question, it will be, you know, is post-humanism a utopia of goodness? Because uh, I feel like what is good and evil for a post-human consciousness? I, I really feel this is a question I want to address because somehow, you know, the, the, this ideal of the, Greek, the, the good, the beautiful, the true, which is, which is the Greek idea that Marcino Ficino, uh, uh, no, sorry, that, that uh, you know, uh, all the people from the Enlightenment had, this is somehow, uh, 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 this is the, the mystical aspect of enlightenment. But then if we don't look at this question of what is really good and what is evil, and just you know, oppose evil with, with our uh, conception of goodness, is that 
Um, is that post-humanism? I don't know if I'm framing my question very well. Thank but you so much. Uh, yeah, Jamisha, that's a very interesting question. I'm sure that Debashish will add more. Should I start the Debashish or you want to go? You please, please, okay. Francesca. Yeah. So I would say, Jean Michel, that uh, I am a Lichian scholar. So the answer that I'm going to give you may be different from what we're going to hear with Debashish or maybe Jonathan and Stephen, if you want to add. But coming from Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche was very clear about going beyond good and evil. Um, this is why I would say that uh, I would say that posthumans cannot support a notion of an absolute good versus an absolute evil. What is an absolute evil when we realize that we are all of that? I love your question because I also want to say that in my path, and I do not want to generalize my experience and my take on philosophical posthumanism or existential posthumanism to everyone else. That's why I always say. We need many voices. We need the conversation more than the answers. And of course, in the past, the real philosophers were not the ones who are going to give you the good answer. We're the ones who are, who are going to give you the good questions. And for instance, Socrates is the one, the Socratic model, is the idea of asking you the question that really allows you to think what you need to think because you are not Socrates. Socrates cannot answer for you. Of course, you are part of the same uh, manifestation. But still, why are you here then? Why are, are you not? Why aren't you Socrates? Why are you not Socrates in this manifestation? So the point is that uh, in my life, I am uh, 44 or five, and I was born in 1978. So I had uh, more than four decades living as a human being on planet Earth in the 21st century. And I can say that in my experience, there are some habits that humans have been eventually accumulating that are very disrupt disruptive, that are very, um, that bring a lot of misery. Uh, for instance, we can talk of uh, racism that actually kill people, physically kill them. Don't even mention psychologically, physically kill them. Uh, sexism, ethnocentrism, colonialism, uh, speciesism, biocentrism. There, are, there is a lot that you can think of. So in that sense, it's a, it's a manifestation that, that is here right now. I realize that these habits that have, been, have become habits, we need to recognize that. Of course, they are diseased habits because they bring disease to our body as a species. Racism, sexism, ethnocentrism, homophobia are actually disease because they actually bring disease to part of our body as a species and to everyone. Because of course, when you have some part of the body that has been attacked, the whole body is sick. That's cancer when you're talking about biology. So I would say that as someone who has been here for more than four decades, which is not a lot, months have been much longer than me, uh, but I am also that. I have manifested as, a, as, as, as an organic being, which is a shorter lifespan compared to a mountain. But I can say that those are games that are um, killing myself as well. That are, um, that is, it, it is, we go back to the idea of, of destruction in the process of manifestation. You have creation and destruction. And that's why I'm saying like, if you intentionally, but you need to be very clear about this. And if you intentionally uh, think that playing some harmful games in your life are what you need to do, it's not going to be me telling you, you cannot do that unless you're a child and you're still learning. But once you're a child and you've been guided, eventually if you want to play some dangerous game, it's not up to me to tell you, you should not play those games. I did play dangerous games when I was younger, games that I would no longer play right now. And I was exploring and I knew it was the right thing to do for me at the time. I wanted to know and I explored paths that are not so interesting for me right now anymore. Because now I understand that again, the truth it's, it's inside of you. You don't need to know everything about everyone, even the more obscure, uh, you don't need because you're already there. But I did that, I am now 40. My, when I was 20, I was a very different me. Mm -hmm. So I would say that there is no such thing as an absolute truth that can be imposed to everyone because we have our own path. Otherwise, why are we here? What is our game? It's almost like you come to my um, house to watch a beautiful movie. And as soon as you come, I tell you the, the, the end of the movie. You will be disappointed. Say, why are you telling me this? I want to have my own experience of the movie. I didn't want you to, to spoil it. So it's not for us to just tell others what they should be doing. If for us to bring inspiration, 
is for us to be true to ourselves. That's the only thing we can really do. So I would say that in my case, in my 40s, my understanding of existence is being as ethical as you can. Because if I am harming others, I am harming myself. And I know this now at a very deep level. So it is my choice. But I would not say that it is the truth for everyone. It is a path that can go from many different Path, including maybe doing things that are not correct to understand that by doing that, the way maybe you feel is not the way you like to feel. So I would say that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the life it's, uh, is, is material that we are here to explore and to, it's almost like you're going to paint a, a, a painting in many different colors. What are you going to create with that? But eventually this painting is constantly changing. And so I would say that to me, posthumanism at the core is really understanding that there is not an absolute separation between the self and the other. And once I realize that, how can I misbehave with the others if the others are myself? But again, I don't want to generalize for everyone. And I say that people need different experiences. And what I am saying now, I would have not said when I was 20, which still had a wonderful life. I would not change anything in my life. But I was exploring different things in order eventually to who I am now is who I was, the past is here and the future is going to be here. And you don't need to be embracing all of that without shame or without expectations. That's who you are. That's exactly the result of who you are. So again, this is a wonderful topic, uh, good and evil. And I'm sure that the Bashish can add and thank you so much, Jean Michel for bringing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very a complex topic as well. Uh, you know, and I think I really take to heart what you're saying about the fact of big, you know, this is also becoming that we, we are in a process and our values change as we grow. Uh, and so from that point of view, we have to allow that process to occur and for people to develop their own sense of values. Uh, but at the same time, you know, just like you mentioned Nietzsche and beyond good and evil, but Nietzsche also had some values regarding what he called nihilism, uh, what he called um, reactionary uh, behavior, rasantima, etc. Similarly, we have uh, in Vedantic traditions in India, we have no absolute evil because it's, it's actually an absolute monism. But at the same time, you do have a sense of relative evil. And relative evil is part of our existence uh, here. So we, in that sense, uh, there is a certain kind of a growth that takes place towards wholeness. Uh, and by wholeness, we mean not merely the psychological wholeness, but cosmological wholeness. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, there is a certain kind of va internal valuation of the self that is going on, but also there is a valuation of the world that's going on. And that's the reason why, say, in, in Vedic or Vedantic traditions, the divine comes again and again to rectify adharma. So the, the adharma, which is right now why we are talking about post-humanism, is because in a sense, the adharma has grown to a point where it's difficult for us to even think of continuing as we are. And so to recognize that and to work towards the eradication of those wrong frames of you know, self-aggrandizement, uh, I think is uh, also important to see as a kind of a valuation with regard to good and evil. I think ethically speaking, I think ethics, the whole understanding of ethics has to be more nuanced than morality which is creating an external frame of good and evil. Uh, it has to become something which is related to inner understanding and also to you know, the sense of the whole, the sense of joy, the sense of poesis. Those things are related to, to good and evil as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Can Beautiful. I just ask uh, for logistics? So I see that we have... Uh, 14 minutes left. Should we maybe get the questions from Lucia, Ellington, and Dana together? And then between Devashish, myself, Jonathan, and Stephen, we can answer. So we make sure that we explore all the questions. Because I'm, I'm afraid that maybe by the time we get to then, and maybe we are at 7 p.m. How's that? How is that? Good? Is it possible? Let's do it. Hi. <laughs> 
I am so happy to speak with you again, Dr. Ferrando. I, wow, I have, you know, miss seeing your face and hearing your voice. It's great to connect again. I'm, I'm so happy that I, I found out about this. I have a friend who's now attending CIIS, uh, CIIS and um, this is just a wonderful like co-collaboration of NYU and uh, CIIS. It's, it's incredible to be here now. So thank you. Um, I, Pinto, can I just I introduce you to everyone because you need to know oh. Wellington is. <laughs> Wellington is a wonderful mm. uh, thinker. He also was one of my students. He's working actually on spiritual transhumanism. So Wellington, I also yeah. want to hear, of course, all that you have to say, but it's such a great joy to see you again. And by the way, mm. we're going to, but I am back in the city, so if you are still around, we are going to have some possible coffee, but again, I want to hear your, your, your question. But again, Wellington is a wonderful, uh, wonderful thinker and, uh, and spiritual transhumanism is a very interesting uh, mm. perspective as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, we'll definitely meet up. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Ellington Bland. I am an NYU student. I'm a senior now at NYU. I'm in the program of individualized study, so I'm making my own major at NYU. And I'm studying what I consider celestial beings, uh, celebrity culture, and cyberspace. So a lot of these conversations about posthumanism and uh, especially transhumanism come up often. Um, I have recently been looking into what I consider, uh, or what I, I guess, eh, I could say, yeah, like founded, coined a term called cosmic transhumanism. Um, and so instead of really looking at the uh, technologies and the devices of you know the present age as a, a, a means of enhancing the human condition and moving beyond the current capabilities of human being, I, I've really looked at using the planet and celestial bodies and the stars as the technology, quote unquote, um, to uh, becoming transhuman or posthuman. So thank you so much uh, for giving me this space to share. And I, so the question, I guess, uh, two questions were coming up really, but one of the most pertinent ones was, you know, just looking forward, um, I know that like uh, posthumanism is so like new um, with that as a developing field. How can one go about studying posthumanism uh, more at the graduate or undergraduate level? Like, I haven't seen any posthuman, you know, uh, programs really. So, how does one go about making that more of a field, uh, a developing in, in this developing field? How does one go about making it more of a, an actual quote unquote field of study rather than just maybe like a branch of philosophy? Thank you. Thank you so much, Linton. And we're going to address your question. We're just going to get maybe all the questions also with Lucia and then again, thank you so much. Lucia, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. It's very nice to meet you. Um, in uh, one of the uh, students in the SY Psychology MA program and my background is in medicine. So I'm you, one of those people that usually don't come to these meetings, but I'm very excited to be here. And, and I think it's a good thing to go after Wellington because I'm more interest in how to apply it more more than how to theoretical is in living it in applying it you say something in the in the lecture and please correct me if i wrote it um if i miss miss anything in the mystic experience there is no separation of, of a separation between who i am and how i of the self and the experience of who, who i am and my experience and I'm very interested in this because recently I gave a lecture by mistake about the mystics aspect of medicine. So it's incorporating in the medical experience, in the surgery, in the procedure, in the consult, the spiritual aspect of the doctor and the patient, the, uh, the beliefs, the culture, uh, how can how that has a point of art? Um, in, in some other in another class, we're talking about uh, music as healing, the healing method. So, for me, is that point when I talk to them and they told me give a, a talk about uh, how to say inspiring medical students. I didn't know what to tell them. It's hard. It's difficult. You have to study. Yes, you have to study. You cannot do surgery without knowing anatomy. But if you can make that the experience, a whole experience of the spirit, the emotion, the human connection, the expansion of the self through a medical experience, then it becomes a purpose. And at that point, 
you become the experience. So I just wanted to, to point that out and see if from the academic that Welling is talking, then we go to that kind of in the day-to-day -day work in a hospital, how we can put the post-humanist of medicine in, in place. Thank you. The wonderful question. Thank you so much, Lucia, which also connects very well with Ellington. So that's perfect. And Dana, do you mind maybe also like uh, posing your question or introducing yourself? I oh, want to sure. meet you as well. Uh, sure. I, I'm an online MA student graduating this semester, um, going into the PhD program in the fall at East West Psychology. And Mike, thank you for this amazing dialogue, both of you, all of you, everyone. My question is, and it, it sort of follows um, Lucia, is, um, is there anything that you can offer as recommendations for setting in motion this sea change of identity towards the existential post-human? And I ask both of you that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you so much, everyone. This is, these are all great questions. Debashish, who would like to start, or, or Jonathan or Steven, who would like to go first? You, you, you go first, please, Francesca. Right. Okay. Yeah. I would say that once we realize that what we do is who we are, once we realize that what we manifest is not just an experience, is literally what we are, because who I am is also what I am, is also when I am, is also where I am, is all of that. When we realize that, I think that the possibility of just accepting what is already there is no longer an option. I may sound a little radical here, but I think, and I really believe this deeply to the point that I am in a little bit of a crisis myself, because I realize that academia, the way has been conceived, not just intellectually. We know that most academia is still highly anthropocentric, is still highly humanistic. And if you want to go on, it's still highly sexist and still highly racist and still highly, and go on, ethnocentric. We know all of that. Things are changing. But is that enough? And now I feel another layer of, uh, um, of questioning because academia has been great for me to allow my intellectual understanding to flourish. I met amazing people. I really, it really allowed me to deepen in um, with, as a razor with my intellect to understand reality. But now I realize that understanding reality uh, just with the mind is not enough. And I think this is when a lot, many of the questions come together. I think that we can no longer think of institutions that offer education in settings that are completely separated from non-human entities, like in small classrooms with no windows. We need to have a different type of education. I'm telling you that I am in my 40s, as I mentioned, and I started to develop an issue with my body because I've been sitting too long writing, too long. I just finished my second book. I knew, I said, this is almost my last book. I have one more in me. And that's it, you are going to die. And I'm not joking. I was like, my body's not reacting very well anymore. I was writing too many hours. And sure enough, I did my blood exams and my blood is always been great. And now it's like, what's going on with you? You need to see a doctor. I knew that. I didn't need my blood exams to know that that was not healthy for me to just be sitting in front of a computer writing. It's no longer an option for me. I know that that type of disembodied mind is killing me. So now I am in this uh, crisis thinking I love academia, I love teaching, I love my students, I love my colleagues. I can no longer think though of a place where people just sit in a small room where we are not walking around, where there is no trees, where there are not non-human others, when we, we, we are not interacting in other ways than the linear way of, of a teacher talking to students in a small environment within buildings, within cities and so on. That should be part of it, but should be not just the way. Uh, and I was talking with my students recently, and, and many students are mostly sitting all day long for 12 hours in front of a screen. They are young, but when they get older, this is going to be hard on their bodies. So it's almost like we are accepting that technology is a function. It is not an addiction. I'm accepting that our society uses technology as a function, but we are not changing education to understand that we can no longer think of technology as something we are using. 
is not. It's something that we are. And our bodies are not made to sit in front of a screen all day long. They are simply not made for that. And I'm telling you of, of, of experience. I just got really bad blood results and I need to work on it and started to do yoga again. And it's amazing. I already feel so much better. We cannot just think that we, I am just going to understand who I am through my mind. So I would say there are posthuman studies, um, master and uh, degrees for sure. Um, PhD is not as many, there should be more. They're really flourishing. I'm getting a lot of invitations to be part of committees that are actually embracing these. Uh, to a lot of centers of posthuman studies that are flourishing in many, many countries. Uh, recently, uh, a bunch of them flourished, for instance, in India, in Korea, in, 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 in Norway, in, in Sweden, in the United States, in Colombia, you name it, in Peru, they're really flourishing. But I'm getting maybe a little more on the existential side of it. And now that I see all of this happening, it's wonderful, but can we still do it just by teaching to our students in the classic way, in the humanistic way, in the way that was a product, a product of the Enlightenment? Because the current way of, of education is a direct product of the Enlightenment, of the Industrial Revolution, where people were now going to be educated in order to eventually also know how to run a factory, the machine. Now I feel that if you think of education, in the past, uh, the Greeks, the, the ancient uh, rishis, no one studied that way. It's not that you had a teacher and, and people sitting all day long inside. They would be outside, they would be moving. Uh, I went to Plato's, uh, um, the place where he used to, to, to teach, and this is outdoor. There are plants, really ancient olive, uh, olive, olive trees. Uh, and they were constantly moving. Plato is actually come because he had a lot of muscles. He used to do uh, a lot of exercise. So I would say that I think we need to be brave. I really believe this. And I know that I'm, I feel like maybe I'm asking too much for academia because it's been almost uh, standardized in this uh, Western uh, centric idea of like the mind separated from the body. So if you become really good with your mind, you got it. You did not get it. You're going to get... Uh, you know, like some type of disease and telling you from just being in my mind, writing my second book. I would say that we need to be brave, not just in what we teach with a shift from anthropocentrism, from humanist to post-humanist, but also in the way we teach. And we need to embrace this, of course, in the science, of course, in hospitals. Hospitals where people go because they're sick. How can we think of an hospital with the, in the current way it is? And I'm very, I am very grateful for hospitals. I'm, I'm alive because of hospitals. When I was, many years ago, I got malaria when I was traveling. It was a wonderful year of my life. But I almost died because of, of malaria. And I was in Costa Rica. They, they, they took completely care of me, uh, freeing the hospitals. And I, I, I am alive because the care that was given to me in an hospital in Costa Rica for people that I don't even know. So I'm very grateful. I'm not saying that it's wrong. But now that we know that healing, it comes as a whole experience, we can think of hospitals and health in a different way that is not just separated. Now we are just fixing the body. You don't need your mind because now your body is sick, but they're not separated. So in that sense, I think we need to be brave and try different things. It's not easy. And I tell you, because I've been giving a lot of thoughts about this. It's not going to be easy, but I think it's the only thing we can do. Trying different things, exploring different paths, trying. It's not going to necessarily work, but we need to try. And I'm sure that the Bashish can add much more to this. No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Francesca. I don't have too much to add. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on what you're saying. It's, it makes so much sense, and particularly in our times. And as we know, over the last few years, uh, we have, we've hardly moved out. We've hardly seen each other. We don't really know what people are like. So it's almost a surreal experience when you meet somebody. And academia has also changed. I think the mind-body split has increased tremendously over the last two or three years. Um, our demographics have changed. People used to come, our, my department, East-West Psychology, used to be known for its embodied practices and embodied education. It's now, uh, the, the students don't want to come to school. Uh, they don't want to meet uh, they're happy staying at home because they save time, not taking some public transport. They're afraid to take public transport. But at the same time, I think uh, what you're talking about is exactly the kind of uh, education that people like Tagore started in his Shantini Ketan, uh, you know, in Oroville. Th those are the kind of, you know, whole person education 
where you're learning in the middle of nature with each other, with non-humans and experiencing yourself as that. And so we have to do that. And I think what we are talking about in our department is uh, having intensives where, you know, short periods of time where we are in nature, we actually spend time together. Um, and then, you know, we have to, in a sense, uh, alternate, you know, to, to make use of the situation as it is right now. Uh, it's an it's experimental. As you said, we have to try it out. We, we can't have a single solution. But if we don't try it out, we'll have no solution. That's the important thing. Um, the thing about what Lucia was saying, uh, that's very interesting. Actually, I have another student, uh, another, uh, you know, uh, that student is from another department from philosophy and religion um, from CIIS, who's a doctor, a surgeon in uh, Los Angeles, uh, working actually as a teacher, as a professor at University of Southern California. And he uh, tries to practice these things. He tries to bring them into his life. And I think that's the first thing to do about it, which is it's not just in the book, but it is really personal. Each one of us has to practice it. It can't be taught as a kind of a stereotypical, practical you know, exercise. So uh, this person really tries internally to make contact with the patient during the surgery, and he gets intuitions even before he goes to the uh, the, the, the hall. Uh, he knows about the person. He'll meditate. He'll actually make inner contact with that person, and many things that he has to do come as visions to him. And he goes and he, so this is actually a transpersonal contact. Uh, it's where the individual boundaries are no longer what they are. We've, we've defied the de definition of the human, in a sense. And uh, what I'm saying is that every one of us has to find ways of doing it, uh, experimenting with our lives to build these transitions from the normal human to the post-human. Thanks, Debashish. Thanks, Francesca. Um, I think we should close here, although this is an infinite uh, conversation necessarily. Um, and also, uh, Stefan and I are going to be uh, having uh, doing a podcast recording with you, Francesca. So we can, uh, Stefan and I will be continuing this conversation. And I will encourage everybody here to um, go to the East West Psychology podcast at eastwestpsychologypodcast.com to, to hear that within a month. But there's other ones you may be also be interested in. Um, so, Let's uh, close here. Thank you so much, Francesca and Debashish Stefan for being here. And we hope to see you all uh, again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Debashish. Incredible as, as usual, seeing you and you. I knew. <laughs> thank you, Francesca. Oh, thank you. And Jonathan, I did not forget about your sitar plan. It was promised S at the beginning. S Raj. Oh, so then we'll Monday, do that. Monday, you'll do some sitar plan for us. And uh, Stephen, was right. so nice meeting you. And thank you so much, uh, Michael, Jean-Michel, um, uh, Ellington, and Lucia, and, and Dana for your question. And everyone else who didn't uh, ask any question was there with us thinking together and, and embodying this meeting together. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a great honor and a pleasure. And thank you so much, CIIS, for the amazing work that you've done since 1970. Thank you so much. And a big, big fan of your work as an institution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.